But I was reminded of the time that I took my little nephew to church one Sunday, and we didn't get up in time to go to the early service. We went to the second service, and the little fellow was wiggling and squirming all the time, and I couldn't keep him quiet. And he pointed to a flag over in the corner of the, ch of the church uh, sanctuary, and he said, what does that flag stand for? He whispered to me. And it was one of these flags covered with, fla uh, uh, covered with stars. And I said, well, that flag stands for all the boys who died in the service. He said, gee, Uncle Ben, did they die in the first service or the second service? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not going to fall away anything too prepared tonight. I want to visit with you for a while about where we are and where we're going and what some of the things we need to do. I don't believe there's ever been a time in history when farmers should be more alert, more concerned over what's happening to America, not just on the farms, but across the nation as well. Conglomerate control of agriculture appears to be as prevalent as ever even worse, now with the Department of Agriculture playing musical chairs with Ralston Perino, where we see Secretary Hardin moving from USDA into Ralston Perino, Earl Butts moving from Ralston Perino into USDA, bringing all of his own old cronies from the Benson days. And what's happening? Well, the, it continues on. 90% of all the broilers today are marketed and raised by a few big feed dealers. We're told that the hog industry is moving in the same direction, and even the feeding of cattle, some of you have been in Texas, will notice that the cattle fed, that the feeding of cattle has been shifting out of the Midwest into the uh, southern states, and in many cases is being done by packers or feed company owners to get an integrated uh, kind of operation. Last spring, I was in Washington, D.C., went in to appear before the House Judiciary Committee in behalf of the National Farmers Union in support of the, uh, of the Family Farm Act of 1972. This is the bill that was introduced by Congressman Aberas. And uh, what, it, what it would do simply would be to prohibit anybody from farming if they owned $3 million or more of non-farm assets. Now, $3 million seems like a lot of money, but we have a lot of these kind of operators in the farming business. Well, anyhow, Secretary Butts sent his top uh, lobbyist over there to defeat that bill, and uh, they got the job done. They defeated it, but uh, Jim says that we'll be back another year with that bill. Well, anyhow, during the cross-examining that day, I was asked if there were any uh, conglomerates in agriculture in South Dakota. And I cited a few, and you could cite some more. I, I noted that the Cannon Towel Company last year went into Sully County and bought several thousand acres of the best wheat land in that county, Cannon Towel Company. We've got an outfit up here in Spink County that calls itself the Hudson Land Company, which is really the Hudson Oil Company out of Kansas City, as old as the old days of the Hudson fur traders. Now, this outfit owns several thousand acres of irrigated land up in Spink County. And they're in the petroleum business mainly. I mentioned the Western Cattle Company out here and mostly in Hawkin County that owns over 100,000 acres of farm and ranch land. And they also have a big grain enterprise in Chicago. But then I told them about a, a smaller conglomerate that we have right here in South Dakota, and there may be more than one, I'll describe this one because I think it may be typical. And I described it to the committee. And as a result, some of you may have uh, seen my statement quoted in the Farm Journal last spring. But this is the, the uh, conglomerate that I described. It owns a big feed mill. As a matter of fact, it's part of, of one of the big feed chains in the Northwest. It also owns a hatchery. Hatches thousands and thousands of chickens every year and then has 40,000 laying hens, the last I knew, probably more than that now, feeding their own feed to their own hens that they hatched from their own chicks. In addition to that, they have two large cattle feeding lots, and in recent summers they have literally been renting all the vacant farms around the area 
to put feeder pigs out on, and they pay some farm wife uh, a couple of dollars a week to drive back and see, drive by and see that the water is still running in the fountain, and they keep the, the feed company keeps the feeders filled. So here you have this kind of a not so big conglomerate, and yet this is typical of a lot of the uh, types of operations that are springing up all over. Now, if you just take a look at this, uh, you can readily understand how this kind of an operation really doesn't need to make a profit feeding cattle, hogs, or chickens because they make their margin of profit on manufacturing the feed or hatching the chickens. And so they can literally run the rest of us right out of business because they don't need to make a profit at what you have to make a profit doing. Now, it's not the legitimate farmer, not, not even the legitimate big farmer that we need to worry about who is trying to make profit at farming. It's those who have the added advantages. And let me list some of the advantages that most conglomerates have because we like to brag that the family farm is the most efficient kind of an operation. And if it is, somebody will say, well, why are you worrying so about the corporation farm taking you out if the family farm is the most efficient? Let me tell you why. These are just a few of the advantages that the corporate conglomerate farm has. They often have the integrated feed and livestock business that I was just talking about. Or sometimes it's the integrated livestock and packing plant, you see, where they don't have to make the profit on the feeding part of their operation. Generally, they have access to low-cost capital for investment. They're part of a big conglomerate. They don't have to go and borrow the money. They have the ability to purchase machinery and supplies wholesale or from their own companies. Tenneco, Tenneco Oil Company, owns J.I. Case and Company. They own the Kern County Land Company, which is one of the largest corporate farms in the, in the country, and they own their own fertilizer mines and, and processing plants. How can you compete with that kind of a competitor? You can't. And then on top of that, they have all kinds of special tax shelters. And that's why we can't compete with them. It isn't that we can't raise food and fiber cheaper than they can on, a, on, a, on an even basis. We can. We can run them out of business because we'll work 24 hours a day if we have to. Their hired men won't. But it, are these other advantages that they have uh, that are difficult to deal with? And virtually every corporation farm enjoys these and sometimes even more advantages. That's why we need to keep pushing for that Family Farm Act of 1972 and, and legislation similar to it right here in South Dakota. Now, nobody needs to tell farmers that this is an election year. Gee, they don't need to around here, do they? You've been told that several times. And I'm not going to make a political speech. But we can kind of tell, it seems to me, that this is an election year because of the recent increase in farm prices that we've seen in some uh, commodities. But even today, with some increases in some farm prices, parity still stands at only about 75 percent, which is a far cry from the 100 percent that we think that we deserve for feeding our country and much of the world. In 1968, candidate Nixon said that the then 74 percent of parity was intolerable. During the, admi the Nixon administration, our research shows, the parity level dropped to as low as 68 percent, its lowest since the heart of the Depression. And as an average, during the past four years under the Nixon administration, the parity ratio has averaged out at 73 percent, which is the lowest average for any four-year period since 1932. Now, on, lo and behold, in spite of that, I'm, no, I'm sure that you read many farm journals and magazines, as I do. And in a recent edition of at least two farm magazines that I've seen, a political ad has appeared citing three reasons why farmers should vote for re-election of the president. Have you seen that one? And two of the reasons, well, and two of the reasons offered are high farm prices and secretary butts. Now, it seems to me that this should be an affront to every farmer of either political, far, either political party. Well, let's take a look at Mr. Butts's record. On several occasions when he's had a chance to make the right choice, this is what he's done. Remember the bill that would have raised price supports by 25 percent? It passed the House and finally lost in the Senate. Secretary Butts came in and opposed that, and we lost it. 
The Family Farm Act of 1972 was opposed by the Secretary of Agriculture. The bargaining bill that would have done something for farmers was opposed by the Secretary of Agriculture. Secretary Butt supported opening the imports of cattle to bring them into the country. Secretary Butts favored restricting beef hide exports to hold down hide prices, and the Congress overruled him on that. He opposed international wheat agreements, which paved the way for the Russian wheat deal that we've heard so much about. And he lowered, Butts lowered milk prices last spring when he had authority to maintain them at a fair level. He supported abolishing the Department of Agriculture and parceling it out to the cabinet po other cabinet posts. Finally, and most flagrant of all, Butts has defended the Russian grain deal that bilked American farmers out of hundreds of millions of dollars. I think this administration has gravely misjudged the intelligence of the American farmer, and I don't know of a single farmer who is going to be taken in by this kind of an advertisement, and I, I hope that you aren't either. What about the Russian wheat deal? I don't want to spend too much time on that because it's already been discussed and Ed Smith may want to comment on it. But just let me review some of the sequences with you. First, Clarence Palmby goes to Russia with his boss Earl Butts to promote a grain sale. But before Palmby goes, he makes a down payment on a $100,000 apartment in New York City, which happens to be the headquarters of Continental Grain Company Remember, the USDA is in Washington, D.C., 150 miles away. Palmby uses the names of several Continental Grain Company executives as references in making the apartment purchase. Well, when they get to Russia, they find the Russians are indeed short of wheat and are suffering the worst drought in 100 years. The facts are that the reports of the drought had been sent to the USDA several weeks before, and according to the Wall Street Journal, Secretary Butts had deliberately kept the report from the American farmer. Well, some kind of a deal was made, and nobody knows for sure what, and Palmby came back home and promptly went to work for the Continental Grain Company, which made a $4 million sale of wheat to Russia. And it was only later, through a congressional investigation, that we're beginning to learn some of the facts about what really happened. And some of the things, as you know, are that the federal government, through the Department of Agriculture, agreed to provide an export subsidy with no ceiling, a guarantee, an open invitation uh, for the grain trading companies to go out and buy as much wheat as they could, compete with each other, uh, and uh, they'd be covered with the export sub subsidy uh, so that they could maintain that low level of sale price to Russia. The export sub subsidy in about 30 days, jump from five cents a bushel to 47 cents a bushel. And we're now just beginning to learn how much the southern wheat farmers lost. And not only the southern wheat farmers, I've talked to a lot of our farmers who, in getting ready for a bumper wheat crop last June, cleaned out their bins and sold their 1971 crop at the low price. And now, of course, the wheat certificate, those of you who are wheat farmers, Know that you get a wheat certificate at the end of every year based on the average market price and 100% of parity. And if you sold at lower than the average market price for the five month marketing period, your wheat certificate is reduced. And uh, this will happen to, has happened to thousands and thousands of farmers, especially in the South and some right here in South Dakota. It turns out that Pomba, Pombe has probably violated some federal law which says that a, an employee of federal government cannot negotiate a contract with a company and then go to work for it for a period of one year after he's dealt uh, as, a, as an officer of the department. And Pombe certainly has violated that law. And as a matter of fact, now we find that the, the Canadians and the United States own the only surplus of wheat in the world. And most of it's just been sold to Russia and if we'd held on to that wheat, we could have demanded the, the, the kind of a price from Russia uh, that the taxpayers are eventually going to have to pay anyhow uh, through the export subsidy. Now, it seems to me that this sale could have been made with commodity credit wheat. And given the profit, 
and the advantage to the, uh, to the farmers where it really belonged. Well, you'll hear some more about that from Weldon Barton, I'm sure. You know, last spring, uh, last summer, really, a lady came into my office, she's a widowed farm wife, and asked my advice about selling the wheat that she had on her farm. It's piled up for several years. Her husband had died, and she could remember, uh, well, she mentioned way back in the 1920s when they'd held some wheat for $3 and ended up selling it for less than $1. And she was worried and wouldn't know if she should sell, and I said, no. You know, I kind of had my tongue in my cheek, but I said, this is an election year. Why don't you keep it till just before election and then sell it? I didn't know how prophetic, prophetic I was really being. Uh, I think I should go into some kind of a um, forecasting business uh, because uh, that was certainly the right thing to do this year. <clears throat> well, what we desperately need if we're to assure long-range foreign trade with fair prices for farmers is an international grains agreement. Farmers Union has fought hard for this kind of world agreement, and the U.S. Senate has instructed the Nixon administration to move toward negotiations, but to date we have seen no action. And you can be assured that Farmers Union will continue its efforts in this direction. Well, I want to uh, give you a quick review now and move to, uh, to the state um, legislative front and our efforts in tax reform. Uh, and tomorrow afternoon, we're going to have our attorney on the program to visit with you about our tax case. We've continued our leadership in the effort to bring about tax reform. All of us lobbied hard in 1972 to get a good tax bill passed, but as you know, nothing happened. We could assume no greater goal, it seems to me, no important goal, than to work for the election of a legislature in, in, on November 7th who will represent the interest of rank and file people. Farmers Union and other farm organizations and commodity groups have pledged to work together during the 1973 session for passage of an income tax bill that would phase out the property tax as a source of revenue for public schools and it will provide for a progressive income tax. Now we heard Herrick Roth this afternoon telling us that that's exactly what they were trying to do in Colorado. More and more in this country, there's developing a philosophy that property taxes should be used for only those services that relate to property. And I want you to digest this. Property taxes can really should really only be used for those services which relate to property. For example, I don't mind paying property taxes on my house or my farm to pay for fire or police protection, to pay for road, roads past my house, streets past my house or roads past my farm, or other costs that are related to property, to physical property. But people programs such as education and welfare should be paid out of people's incomes according to ability to pay, and this means an income tax. And this theory is embodied in our policy program, and this will be the main thrust of our legislative efforts in peer. Now on a new front, Farmers Union has entered as an intervener in the Bell Telephone rate increase case, now before the State Public Utility Commission in peer. And Bell has asked, as you have seen in the papers, for a 9.5%, 9.5% return on their investment. In 1968, the Public Utility Commission authorized Bell uh, to make 7% return on their investment. And that sounds like a pretty good guaranteed return. Now they're back asking for 9.5%, uh, which has been called a 2.5% increase, but in fact, the arithmetic of it is it's a 35% increase if you relate seven to nine and a half, and this is what they're asking for. Now, I'm sure that any farmer would be happy to have a guaranteed return of even 7% on his investment after all of his labor charges and all of his other expenses have been taken out. You know, Bell Telephone is, of course, a monopoly, as most public utilities are. Nobody's going to run a line out in parallel to Bell Telephone's line. Uh, to compete with them the way other businessmen have to compete. And so we have a public utility commission to regulate uh, this kind of a business. Now, if Bell Telephone receives the kind of uh, rate increase that they're requesting, and we've done 
as much arithmetic on this as we can. We've talked to the PUC and done our own computing. We have arrived at a figure of something like this. With an increase by Bell Telephone to 9.5% return on our investment, we could expect an increase in telephone rates statewide, an annual increase of $5,800,000, or spread out over the 165 primary phone users in South Dakota, this would amount to about a $36 a year increase in your telephone bill. This is what they're asking for, and this is an authentic figure. I say that uh, that's just a little bit out of line. And Farmers Union has hired an attorney, and uh, we're challenging that case. And we now have been joined by East River Electric and uh, some other groups, including the Consumers League and SLIC, uh, the uh, low-income group that has put this paper, these papers out on our, on our chairs today is also joining in in the protest. Some of you may remember, I think it was back in 1948 when Paul Upsall was president, at that time, we challenged a Bell Telephone rate increase. And as I read the old papers, uh, they say that uh, we saved the telephone users uh, back in those years something like $2 million. And now we're talking about saving them as much as, uh, as $7 million. Well, I don't want to uh, take up all the time tonight because uh, we've got our guest with us. I just want to close then with a challenge and our challenge is this. All of us must work harder than ever before if we are to save the family farm system and to bring a new era of vitality to rural America. This is an election year. You've been told that. The opportunity lies before us to elect a legislator that is responsive to the people. And I want to make my main thrust in that era, in the legislative election. Believe me, this is even more important than most of, than most of us realize. State government is so terribly important. Let's go all out to elect, elect the right kind of a legislature this year. South Dakota will be electing two congressmen, a governor and a U.S. senator. But South Dakota people will have an opportunity this year that we will probably never again experience, that is to elect to the presidency a native son who knows our people, knows our problems, knows our hopes, and aspirations. This is our year of decision. Let us choose wisely. Thank you. <laughs> North Dakota people are really not too much different than South Dakota people. One of the main differences is that they've got 40,000 members in the Farmers Union. We don't have quite that many yet. And they've done a tremendous job with their dues checkoff. And I don't know what Ed's going to talk to you about tonight, and he may not have time to talk about how, how they're how their cooperatives up there check off 99% of their dues. I mean, they don't have to have membership drives. They can spend their resources and their fuel men's time courting their co-ops and keeping their dues check off coming in and their educational funds. Ed, sometime I'm going to invite you down here for half an hour or more. Tell us just how you get that job done. But I, I think that's terribly important uh, that we review that part of your operation up there. Ed Smith, as you know, is the new vice president of the National Farmers Union and has been president of the North Dakota Farmers Union about as long as I've been your president here. He followed Glenn Talbot. Before that, Ed Smith was a cooperative manager. He managed one of the biggest co-ops in North Dakota. At one time, I think he ran a, a co-op uh, trucking uh, service. And then he worked for the North Dakota Farmers Union for several years until Glenn Talbot retired and Ed Smith became the state president up there. I want you all to give Ed a standing, rousing cheer of acceptance as he comes to the podium. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you very much. Appreciate your kind remarks, and I'm glad to come across the border. It's kind of nice to invade once in a while, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to get this invitation on your 57th annual convention. President Ben, board members, distinguished guests, and friends. 
I, uh, I can't help but say something about North Dakota, Ben. You've, you've had so many accolades uh, about your operation here from all the people today that our membership is up this year. We're happy about it. And as Ben said, we do get it through our checkoff, which permits our people to be working on all of the fronts, excepting driving down the road, picking up the dues. And it's very important that you have this kind of a vehicle, I think, because it ties your cooperatives and the farmers union closer and closer together. Because if, if I understand this well, uh, right, and I manage the cooperative, as Ben said, I understand that a manager can very well start drifting away from the philosophy of, the, of, an, of a farmer's organization. And therefore, I think they have to, have to be tied very closely together. And I remember when we set these in motion, many, many people told us, gosh, if you put the dues check off in, we'll lose all the patronage here and we'll destroy our cooperatives. And I want to tell you, the one I managed at Minot, North Dakota, when I came there, it had some $750,000 volume. When I left, it was uh, 1,400,000, and now it's about $2 uh, dollars, and it still checks off 11 to 1,200 members each year, and they're not afraid of the Farmers Union. They like it, and we think that's what we have to do totally. <clears throat> <clears throat> I, um, I think that it's imperative when we have a state convention of the Farmers Union to talk about our cooperatives, our Farmers Union insurances, and the whole bit. Ben, I just think that all of the members of the Farmers Union, if we had the vehicle that you were talking about here today, all of the managers, all of the board members of our cooperatives, elevators and oil companies and our insurance agents, if they all started heading in the same direction at the same time, Ben, we'd solve many of our problems. And that's what the Farmers Union is all about, is going in the same direction to help the farmers. And we've got to work hard at this one, or we will drift further and further apart and destroy literally all that we spent years and years building. And I, I could go on and on, I suppose, tonight talking about all of the things that, that we have done in the Farmers Union. But I think that, that uh, just in brief, I need to say something about something Ben mentioned this afternoon, the airplane operation. North Dakota Farmers Union has, has had the the facility of a 40 place airplane in which we've taken members from North Dakota, South Dakota into the other states to build Farmers Union. Now we're trying to get a better airplane and the National Farmers Union is going to take this airplane on. They're going to purchase this one. It's going to be based at Jamestown, but we're going to try to involve more people. Getting people to talk to one another across state lines will solve many of the problems that we have at our national convention because I think as, uh, as you presented the South Dakota program at their national convention last year, which I thought was a program for people. It was very difficult to get people from, from the geographic locations far and wide in this nation to understand what you were saying here in South Dakota. But what a tremendous thing it would have been had we had that airplane working constantly, Ben, you could have taken your South Dakota people to Illinois, to Indiana, yes, to Texas and Oklahoma, and the whole bit, and sold them the program. And sold them the kind of a program that you people are talking about. That a program that believes in people, not in just total dollars and cents. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to move into the 20th century. And had we done this, it would have been easier because, as Ben said, we talked about it. But we spent two, three, four days of the national board and the full board of directors, and we still didn't have all the, uh, the wrinkles ironed out because they don't fully understand what these programs really are about. And I, I think it's a, an important thing to look at now. How are we going to get the next kind of a farm program put together? It is my philosophy that unless this nation decides what kind of a policy it's going to have, it's going to be difficult to write a program because you don't know where you're going. I think we, this nation has to set up a federal program policy that says that we want to maintain family-type agriculture and that we need more people out here in South Dakota, North Dakota, and the Plains states, not less of them, with big, uh, big giant empires of agriculture. We need more people out here. And until the nation gets that notion, it's going to be difficult to write a farm program that'll fit into it. So I say again, I think we're going to have set the policy first, maybe before we can get a final program that'll stop this out-migration. 
And I, I'm confident that, it, that we cannot let the, the grain traders sell our grain abroad. No nation, no nation allows this to happen except ours. All of them have their own wheat boards or some branch of the government that sells the grain. And if there is any advantage, it comes back to the government. And as we've had it in the past, we had inverse subsidies that came back to, to the agricultural department, and then it was supposed to pay it back to the farmers. Had we had commodity credit selling the grain this time, it would not have gone billions and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars to the private grain traders, and it would have been a benefit to our nation. So I say again, we may have to change all of these. But to the, tonight, I'd just like to wander around a little bit because, you know, I've been kind of shot down. We've had all the good speakers. You had Jim Patton, and, and you've had some of the great speakers this afternoon that told you about some of the things that are so essential to keep Mer America alive. And I'd like to just skim through this to take you on a ride to show you how, how I think America is faring. Which way America? And I had the opportunity here in August to go to Japan as, a, as an emissary for National Farmers Union. The three or four farm organizations, three farm organizations and the National Council of Cooperatives went to Japan to see the best, the best customer of agricultural products in this nation. Japan buys about a, a, a $2 billion worth of agricultural products. 100 million people on some small islands out there in the Pacific, tremendously industrious, have the capacity to use much of our food, but their diet is much different than ours. And I was so impressed by their industrious, uh, the industriousness of these people, how they were willing to, to do things, how they were able to create things with, 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 their, with their hands, and how they had developed their industry and their technology, but how quaint they were in their living how satisfied they were in houses with no furniture in them all because they don't sit on chairs, they sit on the floor on mats, straw mats. They don't hardly have any furniture. They eat with chopsticks yet, and the new generation, I might say, is not looking at chopsticks very well. They're looking at forks and knives like we have. They say, we're so industrious and everywhere else, why can't we use something that'll go better than chopsticks? And I was amazed at our, at our interpreters who said that they're young people. They're looking for hamburgers and Coke and, and the rock bands. That I, was, I was amazed when I turned on the, the TV over there. It's much more brilliant in color than ours. I don't know why, but it's tremendous. And I saw the rock bands playing American songs in Japanese. Very difficult to understand. I saw cowboy movies with the cowboy from this country talking Japanese as he was driving up, you know, coming up to a person. What, a, what a, a, a tremendous thing to see. Every restaurant and cafe we went into, we heard J Americans rock bands playing Western music. And they're going Western as fast as they can go. And they're going to be one of the greatest purchases of agricultural products that you've ever seen. Well, anyhow, the Farmers Union is an organization that's working on th this level. Tony Deschamps, I'm pinch hitting for him tonight, and I'm sorry he could not be here to, to, to make this presentation. But Tony is in Ottawa at the IFAP conference of which all 40 nations that belong to the IFAP, International Federation of Agricultural Producers, are sitting in Ottawa tonight talking about how do we set up a, a, an agricultural exchange and, and international grains arrangement that says this is the price that's going to go from our country to yours and not have the grain, grain traders making the great profits. I was supposed to be there, but because of necessity, I had to stay here back and keep the home fires going. And the Farmers Union re represents you on many, many fronts. And this, this is what the organization was started for. Because you cannot, alone cannot do some of these things. You cannot be in Washington. You cannot be in Ottawa. You cannot be in Rome or wherever it happens to be. Because this is where the great markets of the next few years are going to be. And this, as I said, this organization fights on all fronts. We tried the coalition of agriculture, where we had all the farm organization join hands trying to get a farm bill through our Congress, and they said, you get all the farm organizations together, and we'll solve, all the, we'll solve your farm pro problem immediately. We got all of them but one. American Farm Bureau Federation wouldn't go along. 
And I've said to the National Board on many occasions, if we got all the farm organizations together, we'd only have 5% of the population. So we've got to take organizations like we had at Western States Water and Power in, in Billings, Montana, uh, two weeks ago. We're going to have to take these organizations, those who are concerned about strip mining, those that are concerned about petroleum and electricity and all the distribution of our resources of this, this nation. That's what I think the next coalition has to be put together from. And if we do that, then we'll solve many of the problems that I see facing us. So I say, which way, America? Are we ready to make the fight? Are we ready, as Farmers Union people, to make that great fight starting out tonight, tomorrow, and the day afterwards? Because I think that the Farmers Union was set up so that their presidents of their specific organizations, state and national, should speak out, as Ben said, and tell it as it is. Tell it as it is. Because we've taken on, I guess, every president and every secretary of agriculture, when he got out of line, it didn't make any difference with party. We've taken them all on. So I think we got license to talk about this and tell it as it is. And I'm, I'm proposing tonight to tell some of this, but I expect it'll be a bit repetitious. I think I may say, I may be talking about some of the things that Ben mentioned very briefly, but I may talk about them in a little different vein. But I'm going to t try to tell you t to what I see happening in America today and why the unrest and, and the deceit and how our young people are concerned. The Farmers Union has gone through some trying times. I remember when the Farmers Union in North Dakota was on trial by the, the, what, the time when the Joe McCarthy fight was on, when they called us communists, pinkos, and tax dodgers, and all of these things. I remember when my, my young people went, our, our children went to school when they used to throw stones at them because their father worked for the farmers' union. But we stood the test of time. We didn't allow them to scare us out of the situation, as they're doing with you tonight. Tomorrow and every day before this election, they're going to challenge you and say, you dare not speak, because if you do, we can't solve the Vietnam War. If you talk against the Russian wheat sale and the manner in which it is handled, we may never, never sell wheat to Russia again. What a lot of hogwash. Hogwash. They've done this over and over. And I, I, I can recall many, many farmers' union people that have said, gosh, we can't get involved in this. This is controversial. I remember many managers, when I was the manager of the Farmers Union Oil Company, said, gosh, if the Farmers Union gets in this, we're going to lose lots of business. And I said, my gosh, if it's, worth if it's right, it's worth fighting for. That dollar volume isn't that important. And I found when you stood right and when you were honest that that never did affect the volume. It's when you cheat and have deceit that you begin to lose the, the credibility and the people start leaving you. So I say, I think we're moving into another era just like this again. I think we're moving into an era when I think the challenge will come again. Will our people dare speak up when we get to the crises, when we have to make up our minds, are we going to speak up or are we going to slink away into the corner and not really take a position? I feel that we have to make the stand on the issues that are before us. And I've seen this nation come through the, the 30s, the depression of the 30s, and I saw a nation that came out of these 30s that was very compassionate. It was a compassionate people that had worked together to try to get themselves out of, the, out of that dilemma. And then, of course, the great wars came, and affluency came along. We helped the great nations of Europe after the devastation and we helped them out through the Marshall Plan. So it proved that America had compassion. But when we developed the atomic bomb, when, we, when that white mushroom cloud came out of the white sands at, uh, of New Mexico, when we saw that mushroom cloud, our military and industrial complex grew up powerful, and we became the, the soul of America changed immediately. We saw America changing immediately because we had a weapon that would now make the rest of the world dance to our tune. It would not be any kind of a, a confrontation because we had the, the ability to destroy. And I was in Japan. I saw the area that was devastated. But today, all you see is a, a marble monument or a spire where the atom bomb was dropped. Everything is built up, and, and we still see the Japanese are very 
are very kind to us, and in fact, uh, in spite of the fact that we use the bomb on them. I've seen this military industrial take over our government step by step. I criticized President Johnson very severely because I saw what was happening to our country. And I think that we've come to the point when we have to take a look and, and speak very clearly. When this, in, the, in our last administration, the Tonkin Bay incident that was held up so long before the truth really came out. Now, this administration, I've seen so many things happen that it almost scares me to death. I watched the confidence of this nation gradually go down. Confidence in its leadership, confidence, yes, in its military that we had re uh, revered so well over all the years, uh, confident that something is going to happen to us. And, and I'm, I'm looking now at the, the shaken confidence of, of many of our young people. When we saw in the Supreme Court of the United States, the President put two appointments up, Hainsworth and Carswell, that couldn't stand the light of day. Two Supreme Court judges that had the kind of records that he felt should sit on the highest tribunal in America couldn't stand the light of day. And when our young college kids saw this, they said, my gosh, what has happened to America when you can't even trust the President of the United States and the kind of people he's trying to put into the Supreme Court? Destroyed the confidence of our young people. And I, I think that's a tragedy. And when we put them on the altar of prophet, sent them to Vietnam, put them on the altar of prophet so that they, they would bring us great returns on our invested dollars and care nothing about uh, how they were going to fare. And I say that war is costing us, has cost us something like 50,000 lives. $400 billion of cold cash has been laid out. And they say before this thing is completely settled out, it may cost this nation $1 trillion. No one can comprehend what a, what a trillion dollars is. But a, even a billion dollars, and I've used this at many meetings, do you actually know what a billion dollars is? If I were to give one of you a thousand dollars a day to spend, just foolishly throw it away, do you know how long it takes to spend the billion dollars? Almost 2,800 years. Almost 2,800 years to spend a billion dollars. Nobody can comprehend what you could have done to your school system, to, your, to all of the hospitals, and all of the necessities of life if we'd have had that $400 billion. And I, I want to just compare another figure. Because many people don't understand what a tragedy this is. $400 billion. It could have bought all of South and North Vietnam. We could have paid every man, woman, and child in North, in North and South Vietnam $10,000 apiece. $10,000 a piece. And you know what the income of those people is? Around $70 or $80 a year per, per earning person. We could have bought them for $10,000 a piece, and they could have had the kind of government they might have liked. What a tragedy that we've blown the, the two country, countries almost off the map. In the last four years, 49% of all the bombs in that war up to this point have been dropped in the last four years. 49%. And you say to our people, gosh, don't say anything about this because this is, this is treasonous. And I just say to you people here, it would be tragic if somebody didn't say something about it. And I, and I see one case after the other in this administration. The IT&T the IT case, when all the records were finally shredded and let out the, uh, so that nobody could read them. I ask you, would, uh, if you had lost any of your records on your income tax, do you suspect that if you'd have said, well, I shredded them, you'd have got away with it? Of course you wouldn't. You've got to prove your point. And they shredded all the records that IT&T had, and they, they, they expended uh, all these funds, and, and then just slid right by. When you have control of, of, the, of the, the judicial and also the law enforcement, then you become very powerful, and this is what's happened. We have the Penn Central. We have the Lockheed. All of the big corporations have been bailed out. And Fred Simonton talked about the rural electrics. Let me just say very quickly here that the rural electrics, 
when we set up these rural electrics, we made a contract with the government of the United States that if we would give area coverage, they would guarantee us 2% money. 2% money, that meant that a man lived 12 miles away or 10 miles away. You had to put the line to him in order to get 2% money. And I just wonder if anybody in this room thinks for one minute that Con Edison in New York, yeah, Northern States Power, Ottertail, or any of the rest of them had that kind of a contract if they'd have said, well, we, we'll pay you more money. I'll bet they'd have held that contract forever. And when they take this 2% money and say, you can't build generation and transmission, then they're getting at the juggler vein of the local cooperative. If you destroy the GNTs of the rural electric cooperatives, you'll, dis you'll cut the juggler vein and they'll bleed them to death. And that's why I say we got to make the fight. And Fred is doing a tremendous job. High interest rates. They're going to raise the interest rates on the rural electric cooperatives. They're going to raise the interest rates, and they have on you. In the, from 1968 to 72, the national debt has risen $73.9 billion. $73.9 billion. The interest rate has gone up about 50%. We're paying $7.27 billion more for interest on the national debt now than we were just four years ago. Who's getting it? The money changers are taking, taking us again and again and again. And I guess you've seen that over and over. And I, I'll not mention many of the other things about the Department of Agriculture. I know that Ben mentioned Ralston Purina and the checkerboard game that went on by that checkerboard company. And then we, we saw what happened in the Department of Agriculture in their great shuffle when the corporations moved into the Agri Department of Agriculture and then they moved back out. And I have never seen in all the years, and you can tell by the color of my hair I've been around, I have never seen anything quite as brazen as this administration has moved in the last four years. The corporations have taken over about every step in it. And I think it's a tragedy that this goes on without somebody taking some kind of a stand on it. And I think it's about time we do. And I, I kind of feel that the, the, the ga grain gamble or whatever you want to call it, the Russian wheat deal, had the farmers known that there was not only a drought in Russia, but when we were in Japan, they informed us that most of the world was very drought stricken. They said America is the only nation that has the capacity to raise food every year because of our geographic location. No, no, no uh, country on earth happens to be in the temperate zone and, and as, as wide a distribution uh, as we have in this one. And, and they say, they can bet on America as always feeding many of the hungry people of the world. And they understand this. But what a tragedy it is that we permitted the Russian deal to go into the hands and such a great scandal. And I know many, many people would say, well, gosh, it's been going on for many years. Why do we get so excited about it now? <coughs> well, as I look at all of the things that have developed, when I see what's taken, uh, what has taken place in the Pentagon, the tremendous pressures that have been put on in the Pentagon onto our, our, our government in the Department of Agriculture and right up to the White House. I'm wondering when we are going to see anything quite as, as shadowy as that one. Many people compared to the Teapot Dome under, under Harding's administration. Never has anything been as brazen as, as the, this since the Teapot Dome. Perhaps many of you don't remember what Teapot Dome was all about. That was when, when the Secretary of Interior gave away all of the oil that was supposed to be set up to, for our naval reserves. And Teapot Dome is, is the area in Wyoming that looks like a teapot and, and a part in, in, in California. When S uh, Senator Albert Fall uh, of New Mexico became the Secretary of Interior, he got a slush fund of $400,000, $400,000 to sell out. And just think what they're selling out for today. $400,000 doesn't even come close to it. They're asking for millions, and they're getting this job done very effectively. So I say we've got many things to take a look at. I know Nixon has been to, to China and Russia, and I'm all for going to China and Russia. The Farmers Union program said so 25 years ago that we ought to have relations, uh, diplomatic relations and trading with China. But what a ridiculous situation 
When we say that we're fighting communism in North Vietnam where there are only 20 million Chinese or, or Vietnamese who are supposed to be communists, 20 million, and he goes to a country with 850 million uh, communists, and when he goes to Russia with another 250 to 280, that's a billion communists that he decided to, to uh, court, and yet we are pouring billions of tons of bombs of TNT upon just a measly 20 million in a little peninsula in Southeast Asia. What a ridiculous situation if we're against communism as he had professed over all these years, what a tragedy this happens to be. So I say it's, it's treasonous to talk today against the involvement of, of the war. It's treasonous to talk about the Russian wheat sale. But tonight I've just kind of skimmed over it. And if, I, if all of America knew all of the things that were going on, I'm sure we'd be in a revolution tomorrow morning if they knew all of the shady deals that have been pulled in this country. So I say to you people, some might, not, might say to us here, you shouldn't get involved in politics. Politics is every day. Politics is every day. You've got to be concerned enough about your state government, as Ben said, about your county government, all of it, our national and so forth. So I say it's time for us to speak up. You heard many people, Harry Cross say, let's not them, let them take over our government. Let's not let them take over our land. Because if you do not uh, get concerned about this particular area, you will have nothing left to say. So I say, even with our cooperatives, our insurances, all of these things, let's not us let somebody else run them. You people ought to be concerned about them, how they're related to you and what they're doing for you. So I say, farmers can no longer sit idly by and decide they can get a good farm program without getting involved in the political arena. Far <clears throat> Excuse me, Farmers Union has said this for many years. So if you don't take any position tonight, I think it's very difficult then for you to come back and complain about the results. Complain about what happens if you don't take a position. Don't let anyone silence you in that one. I know that you've, you've, you've had to take a stand in many times in, in South Dakota, and I think you must decide on the records that I see especially on the two presidential candidates as I see them. You're going to have to make a decision whether you want corporate America to run our government or whether you want the kind of government that you people want with family farmers and all of the things that go with it. And I know many times it would be easier to sit down and not get involved in your cooperative, in your election, and all of the things that went on uh, that go on day by day, just like it was in Germany under Hitler. I think you had referenced that today. But I, I have a, a little reading here or a statement made by Pastor Martin Neumiller in Germany that happened under Hitler. He said, in Germany, they came first for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I, I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me, and by that time, there was nobody left to speak. So I say again tonight, certainly you people have got a stake in this election. You ought to get concerned enough. You ought to be loud enough so that the people understand how you feel about it. If you won't do it today, you may not have that second choice to do it four years hence or two years hence. You've got to do it now. So I say again to you people, you in the South Dakota Farmers Union have got to take this as a clarion call and go out and make the great fight because I believe that senator of yours is the greatest senator that ever came in to the United States Senate. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ed, for coming down across the border and talking to us in that manner. That's been great. I, uh, I promised the uh, constitutional officers running for uh, office in South Dakota that if they would stop by our convention, I would introduce them. And uh, somebody sent up a note saying that Kermit Sandy was a candidate for the